My name is Darren Brenner, and I'm an Associate Professor of Medicine and Surgery in the Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. I'm honored to be presenting this discussion on intestinal overgrowth on behalf of the International Foundation for GI Disorders 30th Anniversary Patient Symposium. And over the course of the next 10 minutes, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what we know, don't know, and what we think is overblown with respects to intestinal overgrowth. So let's begin by talking about something we thought we knew. And historically, we thought that our bodies were made up of more organisms or bacteria than actually human cells. Although over the course of the past few years, that's become contested. What we certainly know is that the number of organisms in our GI tract increases as you move farther down the system. So if you look in the more proximal GI tract, like the stomach, you're gonna find between 100 and 1,000 colony forming units of organisms per milliliter but down in the colon, you'll see more than a trillion. We also know that the types of bacteria change as we move down the GI tract. In the upper part of the GI tract, we know what we see organisms that are aerobic, meaning that they need oxygen to replicate and survive. Whereas in the more distal GI tract, like the colon, these organisms are anaerobic. They don't need that oxygen, and the oxygen may actually be toxic to them and kill them. One thing we know for sure is that the biological diversity of the GI tract increases as we age. We also know how to define different types of intestinal overgrowth. And many of you are probably familiar with the term SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And this is defined as increased concentrations of colonic bacteria in the small intestine that cause symptoms. Now let's talk about that for a minute. A key point here is that these are colonic bacteria because many people are under the misnomer that these are foreign or external bacteria and that's not what this is. Furthermore, this has to be a symptomatic process. We find people all the time that have evidence of overgrowth in the small intestine that are asymptomatic. More recently, we've also had an increase in our lexicon, and we defined a new population of organisms known as intestinal methanogenic overgrowth. And these are organisms that can be found in the small intestine or the colon, and they are not bacteria. They are archaea, they are single-celled organisms, the most common of which is Methanobrevibacter smithii that can live in both parts of the intestinal system. And thus the reason we change the nomenclature is because if they're in the colon, it's not small intestinal, and again, they're not bacteria. Now when it comes to SIBO and EMO, we do not know the absolute incidence and prevalence of these disorders, but we do know that the incidence of SIBO increases as we age. We also have identified multiple protective factors against developing SIBO, and these are things that can be secreted by different intestinal organs, like the stomach. The stomach secretes gastric acid, and gastric acid can kill bacteria in that organism, sorry, and in that organ, and also the proximal small intestine. The liver and pancreas secrete bile acids and pancreatic enzymes that digest foodstuffs for these organisms so that they can't survive, and also can kill the organisms as well. There is normal small intestinal motility, Things in your GI tract are pushed antegrade or downstream. That's how food gets from our mouth to our anus. And remember what I said about SIBO. These are colonic bacteria that have to move upstream like a salmon swimming upstream to get to where they want to be if they're going to cause us problems. And as long as we have this continued peristalsis, those waves will push these organisms back down towards the colon. There is the ileocecal valve. This acts like a break or a door between the small intestine and colon, impeding the ability of these bacteria to move upstream. And then there's the immune system. There are multiple antibodies and immune cells that can kill the bacteria if they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. So obviously what this would mean is the likelihood of intestinal overgrowth increases intuitively if we lose one or more of these protective factors. So let's say our gut motility doesn't work. We're a patient with diabetes or scleroderma or Parkinson's. Because we do not push as well and force things downstream, we may be at increased risk of developing bacterial overgrowth. Let's say that we reduce our stomach acid, our bile salts, or our pancreatic enzymes because our stomach, liver, or gallbladder aren't working well for a multitude of reasons. This may lead to overgrowth. If we have surgical changes to the anatomy, a lot of patients with Crohn's have to have their ileocecal valve resected, and that increases the likelihood that bacteria can move from the colon to the small intestine. And then there are autoimmune disorders. If patients are taking immunosuppressors or things like HIV AIDS, where we don't have the immune cells left to fight these organisms. These are just a few of the various reasons why people can develop intestinal overgrowth. We know what the most common symptoms are in these disorders, and the most common symptom overall is bloating. 
which is the subjective sensation of excess gas within the GI tract. We also see abdominal distension. This is the objective poofing out of the belly or when you come in and you talk to us and you say, doctor or practitioner, every time I eat, I look six to nine months pregnant. People will also complain of increased production and passage of flatus or gas. We have see abdominal pain, nausea, constipation and diarrhea. And in very severe cases, we can see evidence of malabsorption and maldigestion of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. We can see losses of vitamins and micronutrients like vitamin B12 because the organisms use B12 as a food source. So they eat it, they take it away from us. We see iron deficiency because these bacteria degrade or break down the absorptive surfaces in our small intestine where we get our iron. And we can see fat soluble, sorry, fat soluble vitamin deficiencies like vitamin A and vitamin D because if we can't absorb the fats, we can't absorb the vitamins. Now, there are a couple of good ways for looking for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or intestinal methanogenic overgrowth. And the gold standard you see on the right of this slide, this is aspiration and quantitative culture. We actually take the upper endoscopy or upper endoscope, we push it through your GI tract to the last part of the first part of the small intestine called the duodenum, or the first part of the second part of the small intestine known as the jejunum, and we suck up fluid and we send that fluid for culture. Now, this is cumbersome, it's costly, and it's really only done in a few academic centers because it is very hard to do. You can actually contaminate your sample if you pick up bacteria in the mouth or other parts of the GI tract, which can give you a false positive test, making it seem like you have evidence of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, but it really isn't there. So what we use a lot of the time, and many of you have, may have had this test, is what we call breath testing. You take a straw and you blow into a bag or a test tube, then you drink a sugar solution, usually glucose or lactulose, and you blow into sequential bags or test tubes every 15 minutes for the next two hours. And what we can do is we can measure the amount of hydrogen, methane, and hydrogen sulfide that you've blown into these bags. And this is important because human intestinal cells do not produce any of these particular gases. They are produced by bacteria. And that's what helps us determine if you have intestinal overgrowth. Now, hydrogen does not cause symptoms. It is just indicative of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Methane, however, has been correlated with a decrease in intestinal motility and thus constipation. And hydrogen sulfide, most recently, has been associated with an acceleration in gut movement and potentially diarrhea. Now, obviously, once your practitioner tells you you have SIBO or EMO, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to go to Dr. Google. And this can be a bad idea. Because if you type SIBO into the Google search, you'll find that there are almost 6 million results and more than a million and a half recommendations for diet. There are more than 650 YouTube videos and 322 SIBO books on Amazon. And unfortunately, a lot of these fall into the naturopathic or osteopathic domain. And these people will tell you that you should be taking probiotics, prebiotics, nutricidals, herbicidals. And these really have no evidence to support their efficacy and they are unvalidated. I'm showing you on the bottom of this screen a website that talks about a group of practitioners who are experts at treating SIBO. And you can see if you want to go through their two-month program, you can do it for the low, low price of almost $2,400. If you want the six-month mega program, it's $5,400. And everything that they're showing they do really has no evidence to support it. Furthermore, if you have a program that's really going to take six months, why do you offer a two-month program? And if the two-month program works, why do you need six months? So what really should we be doing to treat these disorders? Well, I think that we should look at the evidence, and here's the evidence from the American College of, Gastro sorry, the American College of Gastroenterology guideline on the diagnosis and treatment of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And when it comes to SIBO, you can see on the left a chart of antibiotics and the efficacy of those antibiotics for treating this disorder. My favorite antibiotic is rifaximin because it predominantly stays in the GI tract. 99.6% of this never leaves your GI tract. It is safe and tolerable and has the most data to support its use. On the right side of the screen, you see what we have for emo or intestinal methanogenic overgrowth, and it's newer. This is a nice study that comes from my friend Mark Pimentel's lab at Cedars, where they compared neomycin to rifaximin to the combination of the two. And you can see significantly more patients responded to the combination. The problem here is that emo will most likely recur and you'll have to retreat multiple times. And neomycin is an aminoglycoside, which means that it can cause 
kidney damage, and deafness. So it's dangerous to use it over and over again. As far as the guidelines concerned, they make no recommendations in terms of treating hemo. So if the antibiotics don't work or you have intestinal methanogenic overgrowth and you're worried about using the combination therapy, what can you potentially do? Well, maybe diet. And there are ongoing clinical trials looking at using the low FODMAP diet for both intestinal methanogenic overgrowth and SIBO, although the jury is still out. And the thought process here is that you'll starve the organism so that they can't survive. There have been studies looking at probiotics. They do not seem to be very effective. And for SIBO, uh, fecal microbial transplants, and in many cases, this has actually been shown to make the symptoms worse. In my lab at Northwestern, we're trying an herbal preparation called a trantal. This is a couple of over-the-counter herbals that have been purported to either scavenge methane or kill the organisms that induce methane and potentially reduce the symptoms of EMO. And we're almost done enrolling in that trial and hopefully we'll have data for you soon. So what can I tell you? Let's go back to the beginning. What do we know with respect to intestinal overgrowth? Well, we know that small intestinal bacterial overgrowth develops with a loss of anatomical or functional protective factors. We know that SIBO and EMO are pathogenically distinct. We know that hydrogen correlates with SIBO but doesn't cause symptoms, whereas methane slows down, slows down gut motility and causes constipation. Hydrogen sulfide most recently has been correlated to increased movement and diarrhea. We also know that bloating is the most common symptom of these disorders. What's unknown is the best diagnostic strategy. Quantitative culture or breath test, probably the culture if you can get through it appropriately and correctly. With breath tests, there are different substrates. We cannot tell you exactly what the thresholds should be, and there are discrepancies on what can, constitutes a normal versus an abnormal test. We know as well that the best treatments are antibiotics, but we don't know what to do if the antibiotics fail. And finally, what's overblown are the benefits of naturopathic, behavioral, and dietary cures, which are unsubstantiated at this time by sound and validated data. I'd like to thank you very much for your participation.